And so we come to the complexity and simplicity of form languages. Many, many form languages. Uh, there are about three modernist form languages, very poor in vocabulary, uh, but hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, more traditional form languages. And already we have several major, major problems. Namely, the modernist form languages are a century old. That's a tradition. It's an entrenched tradition. It makes no sense to contrast the modernist form languages with more traditional form languages because the more traditional form languages, say, have been around for 500 years instead of 100 years. But modernist form languages are not modern, so to speak. We can, we can create um, um, innovative uh, form languages today that are going to be modern, but not modernist. Uh, the second a huge problem is that uh, this vocabulary is not available in uh, contemporary architectural discourse, has not been uh, for, uh, for the last century. Uh, I asked my students, um, did you learn about form languages and different form languages? They said, we've never heard the term form language. Yes, but listen, even if you design a doghouse, you need to use a form language. When you put your pencil to paper, when you put your, uh, your elect uh, electronic pencil to the iPad screen, you have to have a form language inside you. You have to have an internalized form language. Otherwise, you cannot d design anything. You cannot draw a line in design. And so this, this is fundamental to, to design, and yet the term form language is hardly ever used. It's not taught in architecture school. It's not mentioned. So where are the form languages? Well, they, they are internalized by uh, architects because they have to apply the form language. Uh, and in, they are internalized by architects or teachers who usually learned it in an internalized manner from their own instructor and they carry it within them. They cannot express it in words in the way that we are doing in this course. And they teach whatever they learned so many years ago, they teach it to the students without explaining. So uh, they, they tell the students, do this, don't do that. Okay, this is a um, sort of a, a police style um, injunction. The student obeys because of the authority. If a student asks, why do I do this and not do that? Well, there is some explanation. It could be intelligent explanation. It could be uh, sort of repeating slogans, which unfortunately is done all over the, all the time. However, the, even the intelligent explanations have not nothing to do with science. They do not rely on experiment. They're not evidence based. Uh, all of architecture is a vast structure that is that is built on on, on sand. It is not a. It is not evidence-based, uh, with, with uh, some very few exceptions. So the explanations do not uh, rely on science. So this is part of this course, to, to wake people up, to try to redo the foundation, so that when a student asks, why do I do this and not that, then we have a scientific explanation based on medical data uh, that the user feels better, it's better for the uh, user's long-term health, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it, it, this is a big, uh, a big revolution that, that has to uh, that has to occur, and um, the present system is, of course, open to terrible abuse, which I have witnessed in juries, uh, in architecture school. Uh, some student has thought out very nicely, very carefully, a project, and then a, a faculty on the jury just demolishes that student uh, in, a, in a very harsh way in front of, uh, in front of other students and in front of other faculty, because. This uh, faculty member does not like the form language, but it is not put in that way. Uh, they find something to criticize and then they bully the student. This, this is totally unacceptable, but it has been going on for decades. Uh, that's why Christopher Alexander absolutely refused to participate in, in juries. He said, juries are the devil's work. He refused to participate in them because he saw the, the, the terrible abuses that were occurring. And, and the possibility of, of uh, just judging something on personal whim without explaining um, what's happening in the form language. So um, once uh, the students now, or at least my students, are aware of the hundreds of different form languages, they can go and they pick and choose elements of the form language. Either they can use the form language that was used successfully in the past without the restriction, why not? It worked in the past. Let's see if it works again. 
All it has to do is to adapt to human needs and, uh, and, uh, uh, and use medical evidence that uh, the users of the final uh, building uh, are, going to, um, are going to have uh, uh, increased well-being and increased health in the long term. So we have the, the medical data uh, available. Any other explanation is really uh, um, goes back to a cult following and it is totally responsible uh, on the part of architects. Uh, uh, to continue uh, building typologies and using form languages that are not good for human health. So my students then, I'm, I'm uh, encouraging them in the, in the upcoming project to, uh, to pick and choose, make up their own form language if they wish to. Pick elements from here, elements from there, put them together in a nice way so that, the for so that you can converse with the form language, okay? It has to make sense but it can have different vocabulary. So the student will pick uh, the vocabulary and, and uh, um, weave it into their own individual form language and design a building, and they're going to present that in class, and we're going to measure certain characteristics. Nothing is, uh, is forbidden. They can, they can pick elements from any form language ever used uh, on the earth throughout, uh, um, uh, by any culture throughout any period. Why limit that? The, the, the limits are ideological. They're ideological blinders imposed by uh, some sort of totalitarian thought that has, unfortunately, uh, it goes back to, to the Bauhaus and, uh, and, the, uh, um, and, and the 20s, the early 20s, uh, in Germany especially. So um, uh, the students will, will use this, for, this form language and they also know something else they know about the pattern language. It's another elephant in the room. Pattern language is never discussed in architecture school. So, okay, we have the form language and that's what we're discussing um, this week and next week. But there's also the, the pattern language, which if, if your design does not satisfy several key patterns, is not going to be adaptive to human use. And the pattern language is totally ignored. Therefore, you may get a nice design, a nice form language that fails to satisfy the patterns, in which case it looks pretty, but it is dysfunctional. So th these, are, these are two huge pieces of, of architecture, of architectural practice and architectural uh, design and theory that are hardly ever discussed. So what is left? of architectural theory, just slogans from the 1920s? Come on, it's time, it's time to uh, throw the garbage out of the window and, and, uh, and help the students to design, to learn how to design a, a healing and healthy environments uh, for everybody. Um, uh, so someone may criticize what I'm saying and say, well, you know, you're introducing all, this, all these new concepts. We, we have not needed the, the concept and the vocabulary of form language, we are beginning, we're beginning along for a hundred years. Perfectly fine, thank you. So you mind your own business. What, what I'm saying though is that everyone has an internalized form language. Even if you don't discuss it, it is hidden. You cannot do without it. Architecture is form language. And if you don't consciously create and choose your form language, someone else has chosen it for you. As I said earlier, maybe one of your instructors sort of transmitted the form language to you subconsciously by showing you uh, something on your studio, on your studio model, by showing you certain buildings, and then you pick up those images, you pick up the form languages from the building. So this is, this is a, a teaching, teaching the form language without mentioning the form language. You're picking it up anyway, but then you don't know what you have picked up because it is internalized. Second thing, be aware, raises, rings a, a, a red alarm. Some of the, uh, some of the um, uh, software, design software, have a hidden bias. They have a form language inside because they were written that way. And you here want to draw a magnificent, innovative building, and the software is guiding your design by putting in its own form language. You don't have the freedom. You have a little bit of freedom, but you're fooled into thinking that you have total freedom. That's not true. So, you know, be aware of it. I'm, I'm raising the alarm. Um, 
that you think you have freedom, but really you don't. Uh, another lack of freedom comes from the, uh, the literature, the press, the magazines. Uh, magazines um, are erroneously thought since the 1960s, 1950s even, they're erroneously thought to give examples of good architecture. That's nonsense. Magazines uh, uh, try to sell uh, products by their sponsors. A, a, a magazine uh, cannot survive without, uh, without advertising. So uh, especially in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, which was the worst period, the magazines were just a propaganda uh, outlet for, uh, say, the industrial materials, plate glass industry. And uh, uh, there are stories uh, that you can read. Um, uh, say, uh, when, when somebody, uh, well-respected well -respected architecture critics and authors criticized uh, curtain walls, plate glass curtain walls, they were fired, or uh, a phone call threatened to, uh, to cut funding to the magazine, uh, threatened to bankrupt the magazine. So uh, uh, no criticism was allowed. You know, this is a, a Soviet-style system. So, okay, why do we care about the magazines? Because the, the, uh, the, the uh, architecture students of that time saw the projects promoted by the magazines, and that was a way to learn form language. You just absorb the form language and you absorb uh, those, those images. And so uh, those students uh, uh, became professional architects, and then when, when time came to design their own buildings, they used the form language that they had uh, imbibed from, uh, from the magazine. So this is something else that uh, we have discussed in the readings in class uh, is um, ecophobia, which can be interpreted in many ways, and it includes the hatred of one's culture, of one's home. Ecos is the home. Um, what does this have to do with architecture? Well, it became fashionable as part of the modernist movement to uh, teach students uh, fanatical hatred of their own uh, architectural culture. Uh, otherwise, uh, the Bauhaus could not replace existing form languages that, that were around for hundreds and thousands of years with their uh, unique, simplistic form language. That was the whole success of, of the Bauhaus modernism movement that convinced people to destroy uh, the existing uh, cultural heritage involving uh, older form languages uh, with higher complexity, let me point out, and to replace them with a very simplistic uh, Bauhaus modernist uh, form languages and one or two variations, but always very simplistic uh, as far as as far as those uh, the vocabulary of those form languages, so that this was a huge commercial and um, uh, and um, ideological success because it took over the whole world. Okay, the international style with its extremely uh, uh, poor form language, simplistic form language, took over the whole world. Um, but this was aided by huge money interests. Why? because the huge money interests saw an opportunity to destroy perfectly good urban fabric, uh, building, uh, building stock, and replace it with new stuff. Okay, that's how builders and, and the construction companies and real estate speculators make the money, by building new stuff. So if, if you respect what is there, then you're not going to tear it down, you're going to uh, fix it, okay? Minor interventions to fix it because uh, it already represents uh, many years of, if it's high quality, then uh, it, it's, it costs much less to fix it than to replace it. However, uh, the real estate speculator will not make the enormous amount of money by just fixing something. They want to tear everything down, just like Grand Central Station, no, I'm sorry, Pennsylvania Station in New York City, tear the whole thing down and build some monstrosity and somebody, and the real estate speculator makes uh, hundreds of millions of dollars, and uh, uh, human civilization loses. So um, all of this uh, comes to architecture students as propaganda and images of some uh, enormous new development in the middle of a capital 
city in the world. And paid propagandists show these images and say, look at this wonderful new building designed by this very famous uh, star architect. Isn't this wonderful? Well, uh, uh, students swallow this propaganda, not realizing that this represents uh, a substitution of what is there. Now, if what is there is some big box store, okay, it's, it's architecturally worthless. If, it, if it's uh, replaced by a monstrosity, well, you cannot, you cannot complain, but it could be a cathedral. I mean, as I speak, there is a wonderful church in Lille, de France, that uh, a Gothic church that's going to be destroyed in order to, 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 uh, to uh, erect uh, some concrete box that's horribly ugly and, and, uh, and depressing. Somebody's going to make money out of this. Uh, culture is being destroyed um, in order for somebody to make money. Okay, why don't they build this stupid box somewhere else? Why do they have to destroy this Gothic church? Uh, these questions are not discussed except by uh, journalists who are not in the mainstream. They're kept out of the mainstream. Uh, hopefully, architecture students will, will raise their antennae and pick up what is happening because this influences them and keeps them in the box and, and, uh, and tells them to use certain form languages that are really very poor for, uh, for uh, humanity.